fine art in the internet could be a marriage in heaven or it can be a marriage in hell. And I'll show you the risks and also the potentials and some works that we have done at my lab. So I show you three art pieces here. One is very old, it's about 4,000 years old. It's a cuneiform tablet in Sumerian language. The center one is uh, the oldest printed book in Europe. It's a Gutenberg Bible. And on the right side, you see art that is produced based on Google Street View. So these are very different objects, but it's just to show that the interaction of art and technology has led to a co-evolution over the history of mankind. So let's look at the technology behind these artifacts. The first one, you need a stylus to create the tablet. The center one, you need a printing press to print the book and probably some post-processing. And on the right side, you see a Google Street View car. Okay, so very different technologies leading to very different pieces of art. Now, if you go to the internet, you think this is a marvelous channel to socialize and distribute artworks. But if you really look closely, it is completely unclear what you get. So here is an experiment done by data visualization scientists at Google, Viegas and Wattenberg, and they created this mosaic based on a lady with her mind, and putting it together, they call this a beautiful tapestry of half-truths, because you don't quite know what is the original of Lady with, uh, with Her Mind. But beyond color distortions and other artifacts, if you zoom in to a digital representation of this painting, you get this effect that you all know. If you get too close, you get horrible jagged edges. So pixels, which is the basis of digitization, pixels from far away are your friends, from close by are your enemy. We call this the tyranny of the pixel, and it is one of the limitations of putting artwork online. But something else beyond color, distortion, and jagged edges is lost, and that's the materiality of the artwork. On the left side, you see a very famous papyrus. We'll come back to this one. It's housed in the Bodmer Foundation collection. It's called Papyrus 66. And from a picture like the one you see on Wikipedia, it is very hard to know what this manuscript actually is. In the center, you see a stained glass window. It's actually from Lausanne Cathedral. And certainly a photograph of a stained glass is really not the real thing. On the right side, you see a picture that you have seen many times, a kiss by Klimt. Unless you have seen the real thing, you will not gather that this is actually golden leaves over, uh, overlaid on the painting. So there are technological fixes for this. And as I jokingly mentioned, I have to be careful because representatives of these various companies might be in the room. But if you look around, none of them actually wear the, uh, their devices, unless I'm mistaken. So on the left, you see a Google Glass, famous in famous. In the center, you see a virtual reality system and tactile gloves. And on the right side, the famous Oculus Rift. So what I'm trying to say is that current technology is either very limited in showing artwork online, or it leads to devices which are relatively hard to socialize. But beyond this, I think to give materiality to an artwork has many components, not all of which we will be able to actually solve. First, we should be able to go to arbitrary high resolution to really see the details of the artwork. Like on the left side, you have to be able to actually gather the gaze of the lady in the painting. Then you need to show the structure of the painting, which is shown in the middle. This is part of the technique of painters. It's a very important uh, component to actually make you feel what the artwork is about. Finally, is something we call physicality. The sheer size of the painting is very hard to get across on a virtual system like the internet. So at our lab, we set out to try to realize what we call an electronic facsimile. The idea would be to have an electronic version that is as close as possible to the real thing. Now, let me be honest, this is not completely possible with today's technology, but we can do much better what, than what current standards actually do. 
So on the left side, you see an acquisition system, which is a relatively sophisticated multiple enumeration system because you have to illuminate a painting from very uh, different angles as well as from different points of view to really render a painting in a powerful way. In the center, you have what is the core business of my lab. I was told not to use equations at the web, so uh, there is only one up there. It's a uh, re-illumination equation. It's essentially uh, applied mathematic algorithms or signal processing to try to extract the real meaning of the data that we are acquiring. Because on the left, you get very large amounts of data that you have to process in a clever way. Then on the right side, you have an intuitive, interactive, real-time rendering system. The idea is that, for example, on a Surface tablet, you could actually have an effect as if you were holding something close to a facsimile of the artwork. Now, you might wonder why this has not happened. And the truth is that on the left, you see a 19th century uh, camera. Uh, which did a very good job, and in the middle you see a digital camera, which is very close, actually. Uh, un un unlike what you might feel, it is very close to the analog camera, because simply you have replaced the film, the uh, chemical film, by uh, an electronic detector, but other than that, you're acquiring exactly the same type of imagery. On the right side, you have the real thing. It's a so-called light field camera. This particular one is by Lytro, which does a much more sophisticated acquisition, which allows you also to do post-processing, so-called computational imaging, to extract much more information from a photograph. So with this new type of approaches, we went around our home place, which is in Lausanne, and we started a project called e-Cathedral, trying to render the Lausanne Cathedral, a beautiful cathedral from the 12th century, and to give, for example, the impression of the acoustics, which is very complex. So on the left side, you see an acquisition system, which was done with colleagues at TU, uh, TU Aachen, which tries to acquire all the complexity of the acoustics of the cathedral. Then we set out to actually acquire the rose window, a gigantic uh, 13th century stained glass. I have a short movie about it to try to show you how you could render uh, stained glass if acquired correctly. First, there is, it's one of the most complex rose windows that is known. It's built around uh, something that leads to an imago mundo, a, a view of the world as seen by the builders of the cathedral at that time. Then we did virtual re-illumination. This is just to show you the effect. So you can have the role of the uh, Lausanne Cathedral re-illuminated. You can zoom into the details. It's a very scary uh, imagery, actually very pagan in, in style. And uh, this is, allows you to really feel the richness of the stained glass of the Lausanne Cathedral. The next step was we interacted with uh, Bodmer Foundation in Geneva, which houses some of uh, an incredible collection of rare manuscripts. It's actually a UNESCO historical literary site. And um, together with the Bodmer Foundation and a number of collaborations, we did acquisition of these rare manuscripts, which I will show in a minute. This was done uh, with a startup from the lab, which is led by Loïc Babouas, the first fellow here on the list of uh, founders of the company, which includes an art historian, so it's not just a bunch of geeks, it's really trying to understand what is the right way to interact with artwork and rare manuscripts so as to uh, show them online. I have a short movie about three art pieces uh, from the Bodmer collection. The first one is the Sumerian tablet, so you can zoom in, you can render the three-dimensional uh, surface. It's exaggerated here to really show you how it is done. You can relight it from arbitrary directions. And this, of course, gives you a much better feeling of what this Sumerian tablet is. What it is really is essentially an Excel table because that's what people were doing 4,000 years ago already. It's uh, <laughs> keeping you know, track of uh, accounting. The second one is a Fayum mummy portrait. That's a particular technique that was used uh, in, in the second century. It's wax painted on wood and put on mummies. It's a very particular technique. And again, if you get close by, you relight it, you get a much better materiality of this artwork. Last but not least, we get to the famous 
Papyrus 66. It was found in 1952. It's believed to be the oldest remaining copy of uh, text from the New Testament. It's the Gospel of John. It's a very rare, it's probably the last time it was taken out to be actually acquired by this new technology. Then it goes back into a vault. It is not shown in public, not even at the museum or the Bodmer Foundation. It's a very touching experience actually to go and, and be able to acquire such a rare art piece. Now let's see why we really would like to do this. Why do we want to develop new technologies to bring art onto an interactive platform. One reason is certainly what Sarah already mentioned. Museums in the world have large parts of their collections, actually a large majority of the collection, in their vaults, in the basements, and very few is actually shown. And if appropriate technology is being developed and standardized, we believe that we can motivate museums to actually show their artworks uh, rather than leaving them in their vaults. The other reason, of course, is one of socializing artworks. We believe that putting art on the internet will allow to share what is most precious to civilizations and will be helpful in the understanding between different cultures. Preservation has also been mentioned by Sara. Uh, I take another example. You probably hold, uh, heard about the stolen Picassos and money from the Netherlands, which then were burnt in Romania by the mother of one of the thieves. Uh, to try to protect him, and um, it turns out there were actually no good pictures of these Picassos and Monets, so they are gone forever. So it is also a good idea to have digital, extremely high quality digital copies of singular artworks like these ones. The second example on the right is about scholarship. You probably know about the Dead Sea Scrolls and other rare manuscripts uh, which are often hidden and not available for serious scholarship worldwide. Putting the material online would actually allow to uh, do this work much more efficiently. But the true potential we see of developing art online is to create something that would be the equivalent of what you all know, the iTunes for music or Spotify or the Netflix for video. And this is if we had a very, very good standard for representing artwork on the internet, it would create a real digital channel to share artwork. And this would allow museums actually to develop a digital version of their collections. It would allow collectors to share their treasures. It would ultimately lead to what I call a Wikipedia for artworks. And I sort of come back to uh, a quote by William Blake who said, the foundation of empire is science and art. Remove it or degrade it and the empire is no more. I really believe that what makes civilization is the connection between art, which is emotion, and science, which is knowledge. And this is really what will be left in a few thousand years. We looked at manuscripts and art pieces from several thousand years ago. Let's think about what will be left of the 21st century in 2000 years. Thank you very much for your attention.